Let's welcome Mr. Eric Bowling. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gary Cole, and I have the honor of being the Chief Development Officer here at the Ronald Reagan Foundation Institute. As is customary, so that we can honor our men and women serving around the world, defending our freedoms, if you can please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, you're in for a treat today. Uh, before I bring our special guests to the stage, I want to set the framework around the conversation we're going to have. In his remarks to the Reagan Administration Executive Forum in 1982, President Reagan urged his staff not to get bogged down in the Potomac fever, reminding that their jobs were to drain the swamp of overtaxation, regulation, and runaway inflation. Sound familiar? I think you'll, what you'll hear today is that the notion of draining the swamp or getting bogged down has both figurative and literal meanings. Uh, and those meanings date back to the origin, origin of the Republic. I've read at least one noted ecologist is very upset that this mantra uh, gained popularity again in President Trump's last campaign. He said, swamps are not useless ecosystems to be drained, but rather sources of resource abundance. Well, I've seen Duck Dynasty. <laughs> and I know whether in Louisiana or Washington, DC, there are scary creatures in swamps. In the 1600s, the Dutch engineers drained swamps when building uh, buildings, new towns, and even vineyards. They looked at that as part of a reclamation project, reclaiming the land for their new vineyards, for their new buildings. I'd like to think that many of us believe that we're in a reclamation project ourselves and reclaiming some of those principles and ideals that President Reagan so passionately promoted. Would you agree? Yes. Including civil discourse. So speaking of civil discourse, I can't think of a better person to share his insights with us today than Eric Bowling. This is his first forum at the Reagan Library, and I expect uh, his remarks today will provide both a history lesson, lesson and a cautionary tale for current and future political leaders. His latest book, The Swamp, is already a bestseller, provides an historic synopsis of corruption and cronyism in DC, and is available in our bookstore upstairs. Eric currently serves as co-host of the Fox News Specialist and a commodities contributor to both FNC and Fox Business Network. In addition, he's a best-selling author, a former commodity trader, a former professional baseball player, and a guy who refuses to tweet my Twitter posts or likes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the Reagan Library, Eric Bowling. Thank you, brother. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Everyone great? We're going to make the Reagan Library great again? All right. I have to start this way. I start all these. We've been all over the country. We're in Florida, we're in South Carolina, we're, we're in California, we're going to Vegas, we're going to Texas after this. But I always want to start it because I have to get a feel for who you guys are. You guys, a lot of you see me, you know, you know me from Fox, but, but show of hands, uh, how many people watch Fox? Yeah. Uh, it's usually like that. It's usually like that. How many people watch or watched The Five? Yeah. Okay, all right. How many people watch The Specialist, the show I'm on? Okay, 
All right, we're getting there. Um, how many people are pro Donald Trump? Okay, I'll do this now. How many people do not like Donald Trump? Can I, no, no, I, the, re, the reason why I'm doing this, and I'm not trying to call you guys out, there's two here, all right, this, this is a nice big group. Um, we went to, let's see if I can name all the places. We were in three, four stops in Florida, Vero Beach, we were in, uh, where? Sarasota, Vero Beach, uh, Panama City, and one more, fourth stop somewhere. Villages, in the villages. Then we went to South Carolina, we stopped in Greenville, we stopped in Myrtle Beach. I did the same thing, exact same thing every single time, and the same thing happened. How many people like Fox? Everyone put their hands up. How many people watch The Specialist? Their hands up. How many people like Trump? Almost the whole room goes up. How many people don't like Trump? And the same thing happened. It was one person every single time. This happens to be two. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, uh, in, in Myrtle Beach, it was actually none. I just want to get a feel for the crowd. I just, look, so I, I understand it's, uh, I'm a pro-Trump guy, and that's probably a lot of the reason why you came out here. And that's, but where in the world have you ever had this many people agree on 99.3% uh, on, on the same thing? It just, it's, it's, it's interesting to me. This helps me a lot because I'll go on Vox, I'll go on TV, and I'll talk about Donald Trump, and I'll get the faces and the eye rolls, and you, know, you don't know what you're talking about. You're ruining the republic. You're a political hack. Uh, don't you see the polls? He's only got 38% approval rating, historically low for a president at this point. And I say to these people on TV, I said, I'm out in talking to the people. Now, granted, it's a, it's a pro-Trump, pro-Fox group uh, gatherings, but you guys are 99% pro-Donald Trump, and there's a reason for that. You're the real people. So about a year and a half ago, when Donald Trump was one of the 17 running on the GOP side for president, he was losing, he was losing, and he was winning, and then he becomes the nominee. And everyone said Hillary Clinton, I screwed up because I helped Donald Trump become the nominee. He'll never be president. Hillary's going to be the next president. It's going to be a liberal Supreme Court forever. Entitlements are going to be out of control, and it's all my fault. So one day I go on air, and on the five, maybe some of you saw this day, and it was, it's a, it was a, a milestone day for me. I just had enough, because I had talked to people, and I know that you guys like Donald Trump. So I say... Stop looking at the polls, look at the people. Anyone remember that day? I got destroyed for that. I got co-hosts calling me out saying that I'm lying to the audience, I'm doing you guys a disservice by saying that, and I was crazy, and I was only doing it because, probably because I wanted to be on Celebrity Apprentice. That's, that was the accusation. <laughs> and, for the record, I didn't want to be on Celebrity Apprentice. Um, but this is it, you're the people. Stop looking, stop looking at his approval ratings, Look, listen to you guys, talk amongst yourselves. I mean, the guy's doing great. We took off yesterday. Um, the stock market had made another record high, another, just shattered another record high. I honestly think, I think it's up somewhere around 18 or 19% from that big dip. Remember when they, he was first elected, all of a sudden the stock market dropped 1,000 points, and I'm going, wait a minute, this is a, small go this is a smaller government conservative versus Hillary and the stock market goes down, this is, there's something wrong. Anyway, that dip to right now, I think we're up 18 or 19%. There are more Americans employed in the United States today than ever in history of the, United, of the Republic. 153 million people employed. No, the top, shattered that record. Home prices off the charts in some certain sectors, existing in new, new homes, certain uh, price ranges, record prices. Again, home prices, labor market, stock market, you want any more? How about consumer confidence? How about business confidence? So I say all these things on TV and then people say, oh, you know what you're doing? You're giving Barack Obama a, a, an A plus for his report card, his exit report card. And I said, no. No one in their right mind, anyone own a business? Small business owners anywhere? Yeah. Do you invest going forward or do you invest because some, something that happened last, last month, last year, or last decade? You, what, what you see going forward, you add to your business, you hire people, you invest in yourself, in your home, in your business, in your company, um, because you think the environment's gonna be better going forward, not what happened before. So this is Donald Trump's economy, he's doing great. So, um, is that my phone? <laughs> are, we, are we Facebook living? All right, we're Facebook living. Um, okay, so, so there it is. So Donald Trump is doing great, but if you listen to the mainstream media, he's terrible. He's going to get impeached. They're going to drag him out of here. Treason, yada, yada, yada. He's doing great because 
you guys understand what Donald Trump is all about. Um, the other thing that is going on right now, and I know, you know, we're going to do a lot of Q&A because I love the Q&A. You guys, it's, it, it, by the way, you can ask me anything. I may not answer everything, but you can ask. Fox, everyone wants to know what, what's going on with Fox. Is Fox changing? Is it evolving? No, it's not. I mean, there's, there, Fox has lost a lot of talent, a lot of people who had been Fox, you know, a year ago, really a, a year ago, this whole big transition started. They're gone, and it takes time. It just takes time for people to, you know, find their place in the, sh in the shows to evolve. Five o'clock, so I'll tell you how that happened. Um, Mr. O'Reilly uh, was parting ways with uh, Fox. Mr. Murdoch calls me in and he says, Eric, come on up uh, to my to conference room on the second floor, the, the ivory tower on the second floor. And he says, uh, congratulations, you have a five o'clock show because the five is moving to nine o'clock, but you're going to host that five o'clock show. I want to keep the audience there. I want them to, I want to set us into prime time the way the five used to. So that's, so that's good news. Shakes my hand. I have no idea what he's talking about. I leave and I call my wife and I say, okay, so I'm hosting the five o'clock hour, but I think I'm still hosting the nine o'clock hour too. I'm not sure if I'm still on the five or not. About an hour later, the press release comes out. Jesse Waters will be in, in, the, in the nine o'clock five, and I'm staying at five with uh, Ebony Williams and um, Kat Tim. So that's how that evolved. But it's a process. So everyone's trying to see, everyone's trying to feel, is this the right um, lineup? Are things gonna move? I don't know. I don't know, but for right now, we're doing great, we're beating CNN, we're beating MSNBC, we're beating everybody. Everyone wants to know, yeah. <laughs> Everyone is trying to figure out, is Bill O'Reilly gonna go start another network? I don't know, I, I filled in for Bill, I don't know, 300 times over the last six or seven years, and I've no, no indication, he's never told me a thing. We really didn't talk too much. When he goes on vacation, he goes on vacation. Um, I don't know. I, he, is he going to hook up with Sinclair Media? Maybe. No idea. No, I don't think anyone really knows. Um, Charles May. You know, I mean, so this is a very, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a rocky time right now in the industry. Fox has a lot of eyes on it, and everyone's trying to say, <clears throat> this is going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so they have to be very careful. Charles isn't fired. The, the way I understand it, Charles is on uh, a, 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 a leave um, and, and until they figure out what's going on, what some, of the, what some of the accusations were and whatnot. So I don't know if that's a final chapter for Charles and Fox. I don't know that either. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm <clears throat> now doing the 5 o'clock show, and they give us one week to put this show on the air. One week. And so, and, and frankly, I've, you know, my co-host, they've never hosted a show before. And so it's, it's a learning process. Um, one of the, it's called the specialists. They said, here's what we're going to do. It's going to be the three of you, and you're going to have two specialists every day that you bring in. So the three regulars and then two, two new people every single day. And I'm thinking, okay, so we have, we have, we have to create chemistry with two new people every day. This is a tall order. So we come up on the first day of the show after one week, no practice. Not, we had one segment we practiced, and like, okay, sounds good. We come up on the first day, and I introduced the two specialists, and I realized the audience isn't going to love this show if they don't love the specialists every day, the two new people. So I said, I went to the producers. I said, look, guys, I know we put this together fast, but we have to change it. We have to make this show about... Eric, Kat, and Ebony, the three of us. And if they like, if you guys like us, then you're going to watch the show, and you'll sometimes like the special, sometimes you won't, but you'll still come back tomorrow. Like, no, Bowling, you don't know what you're talking about. Three days into it, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. I begged them, just give me one day. I said, we'll do this. We come up on the show, and it happened to be the day I was opening, and I said, hi, I'm Eric Bowling, along with Ebony K. Williams, Kat Timp, we are the specialists. Um, and then we talk about the main story. We throw to a highlight of the main story, whatever it was. It was May 1st. I'm sorry, it was, this was the week after. So it was like, uh, it, Donald Trump was, it was like his 105th day. And we were talking about his 100 days. And we talked first, and then we brought in the specialist. And, all, and the producer came to me after, right after the show. He goes, that was the best idea uh, you've ever had. We had, to, we had to embrace the audience between, for the three of us. Otherwise, you'd see a specialist you didn't like, you'd change the channel if you made it about them. So then um, 
I pushed to have the end of the show end the same way. If you notice, the show usually ends with, you ask the specialist something, and it was getting to the point where it was like, all right, so what kind of music do you like? And everyone's just like, no, 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 no. This is So we say goodbye to them in the second to last segment, and then we talk about something that interests us. Talk about my, Eric Chase, my son. Can you stand up for one second? I'll, I'll put a picture of Eric up. By the way, I have a picture of, if you go on my Facebook, I have a picture of him voting for Donald Trump. <laughs> At University of Colorado Boulder, one of the most liberal schools on the planet, he stood up and he had a Trump uh, sign and said, uh, vote Trump. And so, I, I'll, so we'll do things like that. Um, just uh, appease me a little bit here, two of my great friends, Greg and Donna Mosin. Can you guys stand up very quick? Great, great conservative, conservatives from Louisiana, just great people, and we're traveling together and we're having so much fun that I had a really good idea. Can I tell them about the idea? We're having so much fun. We've done like two or three of these tours. Um, we're gonna do the next one with a camera crew following us around. And you gotta see the stuff that goes on in between stops. It's just insanity, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, my best friend right here, Sergio Gore, one of the, uh, can you stand up? Ser Sergio, Sergio's from this area, right? What, what, what high school? Venice Beach, in the area. So Sergio, good, very good friend of mine, one of the smartest political operatives you'll ever meet. If you have a chance, shake his hand, say hi to him. And then his parents, Sergio's parents are right here. Anyway, um, so we, we, this, this trip, we, I took yesterday off. I rarely take a day off. Um, in TV, you don't want to take too many days off because someone might like, like what they see when you're taking a day off, so you don't take a lot of them off. Uh, I took yesterday off because I wanted to co come out here, and we had just an amazing time this morning at the Reagan Ranch. We, we got out there this morning around, I guess, 9 o'clock. We spent a couple hours there. It was just unbelievable. It's so beautiful to see where Ronald Reagan spent all of his time away from D.C., and it, it's just incredible. The, the sites are gorgeous. The, the ranch is beautiful, but the house is very modest, um, and you're just like, wow, that guy, it wasn't about all the hoopla and the fame and everything. It was about, he was a real, real person. I think that was just stunning to, to, to see. I'm, I'm thrilled to have that, to have that opportunity. Um, so anyway, okay, so Donald, fast forward to Donald Trump, and then talk about the book for a little bit. A year ago, when he was the nominee and he was going up against Hillary, and I was recommending to everyone watch the people, not the polls, I realized he's going to win. No one else thought he was going to win, and no one on TV. You guys did, because you guys were in charge, and I could see that meeting you, but TV people thought he, he's, there's no chance. He was never going to be able to beat Hillary. Um, and he would, it, it, one of the things he would do is he'd go to these stadiums. He would pack 30,000 people in a stadium. 5,000 people couldn't get in but they stayed there anyway, and they'd wait five hours to hear the guy talk for 30 minutes, right? He's gonna win. But in, this, in these meetings, in these events, it was lock her up and drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. So I keep seeing this, and I'm, I'm like, boy, he's gonna win, but does he know what the swamp is all about? Does he know what he's gonna get himself into? And so I started doing some research, um, and I just, we just found, and we, I have a, a guy who researched the book with me as well, with just putting together stories of cr uh, corruption and cronyism that go on in D.C., your mind would explode. If you read the book, you'll just, you're just going to be blown away how many different types of cronyism and corruption that goes on in the city that's supposed to represent you and me and everyone. Uh, it's almost like a, we send an elected official to D.C. to represent us, the taxpayer and the voter. The minute they get there, they're for sale. Uh, who, who, can, who can help me get reelected best? Lobbyists. I have a whole, this much of the book on, lobby, on lobbyists. It just blows me away on how much money, tens of billions of dollars, are thrown at our lawmakers who don't make a lot of money. $174,000 um, for a senator or congressman. Sounds like a lot, but in, in, in the world, in, living in D.C., after taxes, these guys could probably make more, and women could probably make more money in the private sector, but they don't, they go there. So you think, wow, they must be, you know, in it for the republic. They really care about the republic and us. They don't, they get there and they're, they're whining, they're whined and dined by lobbyists and special interest 
nonstop. Why do you think every restaurant in D.C., you know, Sergio lives in D.C., every restaurant every single night of the week, the most expensive restaurants are packed. You can't get, you can't get a table because no one's spending their own money. They're spending someone else's money. They're being bought nonstop. It's almost like a, a cycle that, that, that you just can't break. So I talk a, a lot of the stories in the book are about how lobbyists have bought, um, bought our politicians. It's awful. It's terrible. There, I wanted to start the book, though, with a really um, interesting, I want a dramatic beginning to the book. And obviously, the, the story that I started with was uh, Senator Kennedy and Mary Jo Kopechny in Chappaquiddick. Now, we all know the story, but, um, but I don't think we all knew some of the details of that. So Senator Kennedy and five of his married friends, and they're all elected and they're all older, six of them, have a cocktail party with six very young, very single, very pretty young ladies, and they're drinking and things are going on. You probably know a lot of this story. Kennedy and Kopechny peel off and they go for the ride in the car. Kennedy drives the car into the water. The car starts filling up with water. Kennedy, who's a competitive swimmer, swims to the side and he sits there and he contemplates his political future. This is what he's worried about. He sits there thinking, how is this going to affect me going forward? What are the people going to think of me? Decides to go back, walk back to the party. Now he's walking past cottage after cottage after cottage with people home with lights on, testified to this. Uh, doesn't think to go and ask for help. Gets back to the party, has another cocktail. Whispers something to one or two of his friends that, that what, what just happened. The friend says, you better tell someone about it. He decides not to. Instead, he goes back to his hotel room where he now is mad because there's a ruckus in the lobby of the hotel. He gets up out of his room. He goes to the front and says to the manager, can you please quiet them down? I'm trying to sleep. Not there's a girl in a car in the water in, uh, off the, the, the bridge of Chappaquiddick. None of that tells the manager to get the cops to, 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 to shut these people down. Still doesn't. The next morning, his friends come to the hotel room, knocks on the door, and see, they say, you got to talk to the cops. You have to go. So he finally gets up the nerve. He makes the call. Cops go. They find the girl. They find the, the, uh, the car. They, the coroner decides that the car didn't sink right away, didn't fill up with water right away. She survived for a while before she died. While he's contemplating his political future, uh, she's still alive. He could have saved her, could have been saved. Here's the, here's the swamp part, though. He gets reelected for the better part of 50 years. That's the swamp. So that, that was the reason why I wanted to start the book that way. We did a lot of uh, uh, talking about, like I said, the lobbyists. And at the end, the last, I'd say, third of the book, it's recommendations to Donald Trump on how he can drain the vast swamp. And it's, it's swampy. By the way, I took shots at Republicans in this book, too. Um, I've gotten more than one phone call from someone in the book who's a Republican saying, why'd you put me in your book? And I said, because it's a swamp and you're a swamp creature. You're, <laughs> you need to go, too. You need to go, too. Um, so, so towards the end, it's, it's the last third of the book, and it's recommendations of Donald Trump. Now, the way that was developed, first of all, I've known Trump for a long time. And if you've watched Fox, you've known I've interviewed him going back seven or eight years. I knew him prior to that when he was doing Apprentice before the Celebrity Apprentice group, so I've known him a long time. We've had conversations, but since he's been president, or since he was campaigner and then president, I've talked to him quite a, bit, quite a few times at the White House, on the phone. One night, um, Eric, my wife, Eric's mom, and I were driving home from a restaurant. It's about 10 o'clock at night, and the phone rings, and it's a block caller ID. So I put it on speaker, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, Eric. This is Donald. <laughs> I was like, congr the first time. It was right after, I think it was right after the election uh, before he got sworn in. I said, congratulations, Mr. President. I called him Donald for 10, 12 years. Mr. President, call me Donald. <laughs> All right. And we just chatted. So I've had a lot of conversations with Donald Trump over the years. The point I'm trying to make is I write the end of the book on some recommendations. One of them is continue to tweet, Mr. President. I love the fact that you tweet. Now, everyone hates the tweeting. I love it. I like to know what the man, the leader of the free world, thinks every morning, right? 
there are a lot of my conservative friends say you're, you're, you're giving him bad advice. No, I think this is good advice. I don't agree with everything he tweets, but I still want to hear what he, what he has to say. So anyway, so I put these recommendations together. You can read, read them, and I think they're pretty solid. And a lot of them have to do with Donald Trump is a businessman. He's not a politician. And I think that's why he's so successful in D.C., because he's brought the businessman to the White House. He's making the Oval Office the way he would treat a boardroom, and I think that's the way to, that's the way you do it. And you're seeing it. You're seeing it play out. Chief of Staff is gone, press secretary gone, and he's bringing in people that he feels comfortable with. Now, you may or may not like who he feels comfortable with, but I like the fact that he's bringing in people that he's, he, he feels com comfortable and confident in. So anyway, so May 1st, we're launching The Specialist, the first day of the show. Call him up, I, this is a couple of days prior, I said, uh, Mr. President, would you, would you consider doing an interview with me so I can put it up on my show the first day to give the show a big splash Big beginning. He said, yeah, come to, come to the White House. We got May 1st in the morning. Now, May 1st was Saturday. It was a Monday, but Saturday prior to that was the 100th day of his presidency. So I couldn't do it on Saturday. He, didn't, he had an event. He had a campaign. He had like some sort of event he was going to, I think, Tennessee somewhere. I'm not sure. Sunday, he didn't, they didn't want to do it at all Sunday. So it had to either be Friday Saturday morning or Monday, and if I did it Friday or Saturday morning, news was breaking all over the place, I may have asked him something that just blew out the interview. So I wanted to do it Monday. It shows, first show is Monday live at 5. So we get there early in the morning, and I have to make a train back. So I do the interview with him, and I bring a, a manuscript of the book. It wasn't even printed yet. And he invites me in, into the Oval Office with my wife, and, and I said, Mr. Here, here's the book. You know, would, you, would, you, would you read it and give me a, a, you know, a comment on the book? He said, I'll read it. I don't know if he ever read it or not, but he had the book prior to anyone having the book, so he had all those recommendations. Anyway, the book comes out. May 1st, I rush back. We do the interview. It's great, whatever. The book comes out um, four weeks ago, five, four or five weeks ago. By the way, New York Times bestseller, the minute it hit. <laughs> Wait, there might be a reason for that. The day the book came out, it was a Tuesday, June 27th. Yeah? Tuesday, June 27th. Uh, I was on Fox and Friends at 7.30 in the morning. Eric Trump was following me. He was on at 8 in the morning. I go on Fox and Friends. We talk about the book. We talk, and it just happened to be there was something that happened that day as well. It, it, and I said, look, I think he's got the right idea on this, this, and this. I get off the set. I tweet my new book out today. Hey, hope you, ho president has a copy. Hope you get one too. He retweets that. <laughs> and so... It's noteworthy that that morning before that Fox and Friends hit, we were 337 ballpark on Amazon. We were number two after his tweet, <laughs> right up to the top. Drudge, Matt Drudge, saw the president tweeted about the book, and I'll take that as a check mark of approval from the president on the book. Drudge put it up on his website uh, for most, most of that, that first day, and it's, it's just been off to the races. We hit the New York Times bestseller list and running, we're still on it four weeks in a row now. So it's been, it's been, a, great, uh, it's been a great run. Um, I love the Q&A portion of this. I really love it, and, and I, I, don't want to, I want you to really think about some of these, th these things. What, whatever you want, you want to talk about Fox, Trump, policy, politics, whatever you want, let's just have some fun. Let's, if, do you want to? Uh, yeah, we, so we have some uh, microphones coming around the room, so raise your hand. And we'll get a microphone to you. So we're going to start over here. OK. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Eric. Oops, is it on? Hi. Um, I have also two college age sons. Yep. And um, one of them is a Bernie socialist, and one of them is a Democrat. I'm sorry. Are you OK? <laughs> Maybe we I have should ask. We have, we have counseling for you out in the hallway. <laughs> Any words of wisdom on how I could flip them? <laughs> Two sons, a Bernie socialist and a, and a Hillary, and a, and a what? A de and a hardcore Democrat lefty. How do you flip them? Um, who, uh, who pays for the college? <laughs> who pays for their expenses? The socialist, is, the socialist is looking for the handouts. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be mean about your children, but here, here's the, make them earn it. Make them figure out what it, what, it, what it feels like to have to work. I happen to have a son who is a conservative. It's great. I, you know, I, I'm fantastic. I don't, I don't have that issue. 
Can I ask you something? Is it hard being a conservative in a very liberal school like Boulder? Stick to your values. Stick to your values. Stick to your values. Your values. Look, just, ju I, I, honestly, I, I think when they first start to work and they realize how much you pay in taxes, how hard it is to earn a living, how hard it is to put uh, a kid through college, let, let them try and put themselves through, I don't know, maybe a semester, and they may get, have a, a different feeling about it. And just keep talking to them. Just talk to them. You know? Yes, ma'am. such a pleasure to hear you speak. I'm such a big fan. I watch Fox, Fox Specialists every day. And I Thank used to you. be part of the news media. I used to work for ABC as a news anchor and news director. I'm almost ashamed to say that these days because of what the media is doing. But I wanted to ask you, since you have an inside track to Donald Trump, um, what's going to happen with Jeff Sessions? Mm, interesting question. Uh, Sessions, what, what, what to do about Jeff Sessions? Um, I think Jeff Sessions let Donald Trump down. I really do. I, you know, he, look, th the way this played out was Donald Trump is talking to people about his, who's going to be his attorney general. He's got a very good relationship with Jeff Sessions, who was there from minute one on the campaign trail, and that was very important. But he never portrayed or never showed Trump that he was going to be the type of guy that was going to recuse himself. The reason why that matters is if Sessions doesn't recuse himself, Rod Rosenstein doesn't get the... Uh, the, the steering wheel uh, of the Department of Justice, which allowed for, for Mueller, the special counsel, to be uh, brought in. It never would have happened without Jeff Sessions stepping aside. And it matters because what Mueller ended up being is not investigating whether or not there was collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. They're going after everything. They're going after every financial document that Donald Trump has ever been a part of. It's a, it is a literal witch hunt. So. You wonder why the delay with Sessions, the anger uh, or the disappointment um, Donald Trump having uh, in, in Jeff Sessions, it's because the investigation is becoming a joke. It's becoming ridiculous. It's just an absolute witch hunt. So he's getting madder and madder that Sessions recused himself. I just I don't even know what the rule, can you unrecuse yourself? But I, even if you could, it doesn't matter. He, at this point, um, I think... I, Trump won't fire Sessions, I don't think. I think he'll hope that Sessions would stay uh, time to move on to someone else. But you're still going to have the general counsels. That, that special counsel is still going to be there. Yeah. Eric, we've got a question right okay. over here. Okay, gotcha. Hi, Eric. It's such a pleasure to meet you and to see you here. I came home a week early from Kentucky with my daughter, and guess who is in Simi Valley? Um, so it's oh, a pleasure. That's so sweet. That's great. <laughs> um, where in Kentucky? Um, Oak Grove, which is just out of Fort Campbell. All right. Sons okay. Military. Gotcha. Um, I, I want to know, how do you handle, I've never in my life, I'm an old lady now, um, I've never seen such divisiveness huh. in my life. It's broken up our families. This whole, um, yeah. you know, I am totally Trump. I was from the very beginning. And I love your opinions, but like the little bantering that you do with like in the past with Juan, and how, <laughs> how do you do that? I mean, I, it's Juan. broken apart our family. It actually almost broke apart the five at one point. I mean, it was, it was the point where uh, I was pro-Trump, um, Greg, Greg and Dana just couldn't stand it, didn't like him, just didn't, there was no, nothing about him they liked. Juan was a liberal, so he was more than willing to jump into that little alliance. And Kimberly, at first, she was, she was back and forth. You know, she wasn't pro-Trump right away, but she got on. And then when he came, so, she, so I was constantly like this with the other host. It got heated. It got heated quite a bit. And, you know, then there was, like, personal comments made about people. It was like, well, we got to tone this down a little bit. I don't know. Trump, that's why he won, though. He brings out that, he brings emotion for the first time. Look what he's done since he's president. I mean, m media across the board is like 50% higher viewership, uh, readership in, in, in New York Times and in other forms of media. So he's bringing a lot of um, interest to the political system. Now, you may not like him, but look, at least we have the, the American people pretty, pretty, fair, pretty strongly engaged in the political process, and that's good. Breaking up families, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's rough. Have, it's rough out there. Another question? Over there. I'm a nurse. 
I deal every day with patients that we're trying to get them out of the hospital, trying to get them covered, trying to pay uh, their medical expenses. Do you see any hope for the quagmire that is now <laughs> in legislators? In, I, I don't know. Uh, this is, this we're is, hoping. Um, yeah. So health care, yeah, what to do about it. First of all, you know, it's, it, genie's out of the bottle thanks to Supreme Court Justice Roberts who said health care, uh, you, you, you're, you're mandated to buy a product. So what do you do now? Um, I'm just blown away that John McCain, look, war hero, I get it. I'm just blown away that he flew across country to start the debate on health care. If he didn't show up, they wouldn't even have the votes to start the debate. Remember, Pence had to break the tie just to get the thing going, right? So McCain made sure that debate was going and then voted against the options that were on the table. And now it looks like the Republicans can't get, get their act together. There was only one of the three options. There are three options. There's a, the, the skinny repeal, the repeal only, and then this other form of just a massive health care problem that the Republicans didn't even want. The, the clean repeal only, not repeal and replace, the clean repeal only, replace over the next whatever, two, three, however long it takes. That was the only option. They had a chance to do it. They fell apart. I don't know. But listen, I'll give you politically. Policy-wise, I think the Republicans are going to, they're going to have some trouble in 2018. Politically, 2018 is going to be rough for the House. They're going to have a hard time because they promised to uh, repeal and replace Obamacare. They didn't. Senate's going to be fine. You're still going to have the presidency in the Senate, but then what do you have? Then if you don't get t tax reform through right now, you may have a hard time or even harder time getting it through after if you lose the House. So this is a big fail on the Republicans' part. But look, you, you can't keep electing rhinos. You can't. Lindsey Graham, John McCain, Murkowski, I mean, Collins is, I don't know what she is, independent, I guess. I mean, these are, are, are they lean left. I just think they're, they're, they're liberals in, in disguise. I think we have a question here. If you want to stand up, please. Great to see you, Eric. You uh, too, sir. We appreciate all of, all of your uh, various shows on, on Fox. I had a follow-up, actually, to the, the question that you just uh, gave some answers to on medi uh, medical and health co coverage. You know, it seems to me that the whole healthcare system has been made to look, at least, and I'm sure it is complicated, but it's been made to look even more complicated than it maybe has to be. I don't know if that's tr a true statement or not, but I'm just wondering, isn't there some way that you would see going forward on healthcare, well, maybe me, going me, in, in a different here. direction? Let, let me ask you something. Um, so for seven years, we as conservatives came on TV and complained about the Obamacare. Just complained till the, 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 the day is long. Um, and the things I complained about were, obviously, you're non-competitive when you can have, I don't know, 40% of the country with one insurer, which means they can charge whatever they want. And you have no choice. You have to buy it, and you can only buy it from that one person. Guess what's going to happen? Premiums are going to go up. Um, they never addressed the, the competition across state lines. They never addressed tort reform, and they never addressed uh, drug pricing. A lot of people talk about drug pricing or even hospital pricing. Why wouldn't you require hospitals to post the prices of procedures and drugs that they're going to use on you? I mean, let them get competitive with each other. Republicans never put that in any of their bills. And why is that? It's the swamp. They're getting, they're getting lobbyist money who tell them, yeah, go ahead, do your thing with healthcare, but don't change my deal. I'm healthcare. You know what the most power? I would say health, the, the health industry, pharma, uh, hospitals, insurance, I, those are probably the strongest um, lobbyists in, in D.C. They have the most money to spend. So they didn't change anything. They tried to slip it through the, exactly the same way Pelosi uh, and Reid and Obama did eight years ago. They did the exact same thing, only they got caught. They, they, they couldn't get it together. I don't know. The, the, the answer would be, I think, do I even say this? People think I'm crazy for saying it. Um, go to a simple majority and put those things in the bill. They say they, say they couldn't put those in the health care bill because you'd have to get a 60-vote majority um, because it would affect you know, too, too many of the fiscal sides of the economy and health care. Go to simple majority, get that stuff in there, get everyone to vote for it. Here's what's going to end up happening, though. You're going to have uh, Obamacare through 2018. Democrats are going to have to defend it. I've already heard people say this is now Trump care because he couldn't replace Obamacare. It's not. This is still Obamacare. It's the Republicans who couldn't get, put something up that was better. 
Okay, thank okay, you. Christine? Hi, Eric. My name's Thelma. I'm a big fan of all your programs. I'd like to introduce my husband, Eric. I had to drag him over here. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Anyway, um, I had a question about Debbie Wasserman Schultz. I suspect, in my own opinion, it's going to open a whole big cobweb and it's all going to lead to Hillary. What is your opinion? I think she's part of the swamp, too. I think they're all part of the swamp. Yeah. Here's a question. Now, this is interesting. So th think about this for just a minute. Je Jeff Sessions. <laughs> Eric, can you take this? That's, your, that's a call for Eric. Um, Jeff Sessions this week decides that he's going to start looking into investigating the other side. Well, what do you think happened now? Do you think that Trump saying, hey, I'm not sure what my, my attorney general is doing, now decides he's going to look at the other side? I think this is all good. I think Sessions can now start to look into what Hillary did with her 33,000 emails. How about this? What Bill Clinton did on that airplane? I want to know more what, what it was talking about. I'm... I find it very hard to believe that Bill Clinton waited 45 minutes for Attorney General uh, Lynch to land and then board her plane, not bringing anyone with him. Remember when everyone freaked out about Donald Trump walking around a big table full of people without bringing an interpreter when he sat down next to Putin? Anyway, Clinton goes on the airplane and talks about grandchildren in golf to Lor Loretta Lynch. And that's not adding up. So, yeah, so I think, I think you're going to start to see the other side being investigated a little bit for, for the first time. I think that's good news. In the back, we've got a couple questions. Do you think that... How old are you? What? How old are you? 11. Awesome. Oh, 12. Good for you. 12. Do you think Hillary will still have a political career? No. <laughs> I hope she does. We can only hope that Hillary Clinton is still trying to run for president in 2020. Let's go. Bring it. That's fantastic. You know what? Maybe she, she third, three strikes you're out. Maybe this time she's, she's done. I think she's done. I think the, the Democrats have realized they put their, their eggs in that basket too many times. The thing about the Democrats, though, they, so far, we're seven months, six months, six, a little over six months into the presidency. All they can be, Chelsea, don't even start. Uh, <laughs> all they can do is be negative to Trump. They hate Trump. I can't stand Trump. Look how terrible Trump is. Russia, Russia, Russia. Instead of developing um, a platform, that, that makes sense, and that's good. Let them keep hating on Trump all they want because they'll get smoked again in 2020. I think he's going to win again in 2020 no matter who they put up. Right here. Hi there, Eric. It's really nice to meet you. I watch you all the time. I am new to the Republican Party. Um, it happened when... Well, thank you. And it happened when Hillary was testifying, what difference does it make with the Benghazi thing? Yeah. And I just... That was it. That was my turning point. My question to you, though, is what bothers me, because I watch Fox like 24-7, and <laughs> like I'm sure everyone here, and it bothers me so much that the Democrats are so demeaning, so glib, so they are so cocky, and how they behave to Republicans yeah. that seem to be the snowflakes that we talk about when we talk about the other people. But it just seems that the, de that the Republicans are so soft that they just take everything that is dished out at them. Yeah. And that really bothers me. Well, because, right. yeah, yeah, I agree with you. So I think what's going on, and, and I think the reason why Donald Trump is having so much, one more question, by the way, they're telling me we got one more. I think Trump is having such a hard time right now. Is he's, he has the Democrats against them, but for the first time, there's a, there's a, a Trump faction of the, of the Republican Party and an anti-Trump faction that is really, really vocal, really powerful, because you know who they are? They're the establishment Republicans that, that have been there forever who don't want, they're part of the swamp and they don't want to be drained. So they're pushing back on Donald Trump very aggressively. Yeah, you want to follow? Watch like the media, and we always talk about the media. They get away with saying such divisive things, yeah. and yeah. the whole thing. I mean, I, like everyone here feels the way I'm sure that I'm talking. So, and I'm not, but it's so insulting, completely insulting all the time. Not just to the president, but to everyone, whether it's cabinet or whether it is the Congress. Yeah. You know, yeah, the media, mainstream media, uh, or they call, or we've been calling it the propaganda stream media. 
All right, we have one more. Back, one last question back in the back. Hi. Hi. So happy to see you here. Thank you. Simi Valley. Um, my question is actually about Fox News. First of all, I, I'm going to make this comment. I really miss Bill O'Reilly. Fox News, do they listen to the people? Do the people write to them and tell them and give them comments on the shows on what's going on? And does Juan, real, Juan Williams really believe what he says? Yeah. <laughs> I think I've had that Juan Williams question on every single stop so far. Uh, he, yeah, he does. I, I, yeah, he does. I, I, so I, so I, if you remember the five, I used to know Bob Beckel very well. He's a good friend of mine. Juan, I've known him for a long time. And you'll go out and have a cocktail with someone or a dinner with someone, and they'll still, they believe, yes, they believe what all that stuff. So getting back to the Fox News, um, I miss Bill too. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I miss Bill. I, I, I obviously can't get involved in what went on because I don't really know what went on, and I don't know what the negotiations were, but I, I, I miss Bill O'Reilly too. Yeah, he was a good guy, good man. Um, one more? No, he's saying we got Last one, last one. What do you think of General Kelly and how is he going to do? I like him. I think he's, he's a very, very strong, strong pick for Donald Trump. I'm shocked he picked General Kelly. I, when, I, when I saw that, that uh, Ryan's previous head retired, I think that was a good thing. I never could understand why Ryan's and Spicer were part of the RNC who asked Donald Trump uh, to step out of the race as a candidate, why they would be chief of staff and press secretary. To make a long story short, um, I'm glad that they're not part of the administration at that level. General Kelly, a, he's a very strong man. I think he's, he's uh, well-liked. He's well-liked in, in, in the West Wing of the White House, which matters. Um, I, I just, I didn't see it coming. I didn't see uh, that as the pick. I think he's strong. I've, Donald Trump has always loved his generals. I mean, he likes having people who have real boots on the ground experience with, with, with the bad stuff. And I think he's, he's, he's a good pick. Do I think he, do I, will he last? I don't know. I have no, what? Scaramucci's a good guy. I've known him a long time, too. Good guy. The rant. All right. The rant. Uh, <laughs> look, you know where Scaramucci is, too. You know, he said Trump, he, he tweets. He tweets his mind, some stuff he likes, some he don't like. Uh, Anthony, has, he, he holds no punches. He's, he's, what you see is what you get. Anthony's the same guy on TV that you, you talk to in the green room or, or, or at, at a restaurant. But do you understand what this is? The, the other side, this, the, the, the comment was it gives the other side fuel for the fire. The other side is so freaked out. It's like catnip to, Trump is like catnip to the Democrats. <laughs> they're, they're all over the, all, it makes them crazy. They're not focusing on a message. There was something very dangerous that almost happened uh, a week ago. I was on Stephanopoulos' show. Chuck Schumer that day said, you know, it's not Russia that caused us to lose the election. And he said, we have a, 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 a a better plan. Remember the economic, the better plan? It happened to be garbage, thankfully, but he, if they start thinking about that for a second, developing something that, that uh, the left can get behind other than we hate Trump, if, 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 their, if their 2020 platform is we hate, 2018 or 2020 platform is we hate Trump, they're going to lose both of them. They're going to lose them both. That's great. But if they start putting something together where, you know, we love Bernie Sanders, um, you know, we need to, to, to get the Hillary side of the party together with the Bernie side of the party. Then they have numbers. Now, I don't think it's good policy, but they have numbers to, to give uh, Trump a run in 2020. All right, we're good? Yes, Eric, thank you very thank much. You you so much. Thank you guys so much. We just signed some books, right? Yes. So if I could have you, uh, if you could keep your seats for a minute, let's let Eric get upstairs and get settled. If you, if you brought a book, he's gonna do a book signing in the mu museum store upstairs.